All right, welcome everybody to the Georgia Recycling Coalition Addressing Textiles webinar. We are so happy you were able to join us today. One, I'm Melissa Radwan. I am the Director of Marketing for RRS, and, and RRS is pleased to be partnering with GRC to bring you this great topic today. A few housekeeping items. All attendees are muted, so we can't hear you, but we do want to hear from you. So please use the Q&A panel to submit your questions, uh, not the chat box, the Q&A panel. There should be a little button at the bottom of your screen uh, that you can type in your questions and we'll be able to uh, answer those at the end of the session. Also, the, re the webinar is being recorded and the GRC will make this available uh, in the very near future. Our agenda today, uh, we're going to have a, a quick welcome by uh, Karen Wilson. Uh, then we're gonna roll into textile recovery uh, with Marissa Adler from RRS. A thrift store collection model by Alicia Ricci, or Ricci, I'm sorry, from America's Thrift Stores. Multifamily collection model with Jana Alfiero of Cortland. And then we're gonna hear about Reloom, which is an amazing initiative. Um, for Affordable Housing Atlanta. Lisa Wise is gonna guide us through that one. We'll then have our question and answer session and Gloria Hardegree of the GRC will do our closing remarks. So at this time, I'd like to uh, ask Karen Wilson, uh, of the, the president for the Georgia Recycling Coalition to say a few words. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you um, to Resource Recycling and you guys agreeing to help host this today. Thank you to Gloria and the program committee, um, primarily Bianca and Abby and all others that helped put this program on um, and helping us stay relevant in today's virtual world. So um, we have great speakers. Thank you to all the speakers. We have some really great speakers lined up that are expertise in this area. And um, thank you to all the participants for joining. We hope you enjoy and we hope you stay engaged in, uh, until about two o'clock and have good questions and let this be interactive for everyone. So thank you all. Look forward to a good meeting. Thank you, Karen. Now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Marissa Adler. Marissa is a senior consultant with RRS supporting corporate and municipal clients in advancing their waste diversion and recovery goals. Marissa's specialty is in textile waste and recovery where she works with collectors, sorter graders, recyclers, brands, retailers, and municipalities to identify scalable recovery solutions for those textiles. Marissa was the lead author on the 2020 white paper, Textile Recovery in the U.S., A Roadmap to Circularity, and she'll be sharing some of that information from that white paper with us today. Marissa, I'm going to hand over control to you, and you can take it away. All right, wonderful. Thanks, Melissa. Great to be here today. Thank you to the GRC for hosting this webinar. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about textile waste and recovery in the United States. Some of the scene setting um, information behind where we are with textile waste generation and collection. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about, sorry, trying to advance my slide. Okay, there we go. That, whoop, went too far. Then I'm gonna talk about how we can transition to a circular economy for textiles. And I'll talk about a few things that are action items that everyone can start on today, tomorrow, to start advancing towards that future circle, circular economy state. We started looking at textile waste um, as a company about four and a half years ago. And one of the statistics that really struck us the most was looking at the US EPA facts and figures data for how textile waste has grown over the past 20 or so years. And this chart, you can see at the very top that textiles have far outpaced the growth of any other major category of waste in our waste stream. Textile waste increased 78% since 2000 um, on an absolute tonnage basis, while the entire waste stream as a whole only grew 10%. And on a per capita basis, textile waste increased 54% um, as compared to a 5% decrease as a, as a whole entire waste stream. So it's growing so, so much faster than any other part of the waste stream. 
And that's a big issue, especially because it's such an environmentally and, um, you know, human um, intensive uh, supply chain. having mouse control issues. Melissa, maybe if I put control back to you and you can just advance for me. All right, great, thank you. So this is showing a general uh, composition of the US waste stream as a whole. And one of the things I wanted to point out is that textiles is not an insignificant portion of the pie. It's just over 6%. And when you're a municipal waste um, coordinator or manager, and you're reaching towards waste increased waste diversion, and maybe you have a zero waste goal, 6% is a sizable uh, portion of the waste stream that you, can, that you can tackle to really help advance that goal. At the same time, the US spends a lot of money to collect and dispose of textile waste in landfills and incinerators. In 2020, we modeled uh, an expenditure of about $4 billion alone just on the textile portion of the waste stream. And so there's a lot we can do to offset those costs and uh, valorize some of the material itself. Okay, next slide. Right now, only 15% of the waste that we generate in the United States is recovered for any kind of uh, beneficial reuse. That means that 85% is going straight to landfill and incineration. And so I know this looks like a very complex um, flow chart and I'm not gonna spend time going through each portion of it. Uh, it'll be available to you afterwards if you're interested in looking at it in more detail. And, it, and it's also in the report that we published, um, which is free to download. Um, but the main point here is that the textiles that are recovered, only less than 1%, which is that really thin green line on top, is fed back into a circular supply chain. So we only use less than 1% um, feedstock of recycled textiles back into textile uh, manufacturing. Okay, next slide. It's also important to know that of that 15% that is diverted, it's traveling through a really complex recovery network. This is a diagram showing just one example of how your, um, let's say, donated clothing um, might travel. So you have the generator in the big green box on the left. That's, you know, let's say it's a post-consumer. Um, you just have a resident who has a bag of old clothes they wanna, they wanna get rid of. They might bring it to a charity or a thrift store. And from there, on average, these locations are, are getting more material than they're able to actually sell on site in their stores. They can sell about 20% of that. That's that 20% um, on the top. 80% on average goes um, site, a lot of it sight unseen, you know, they're not even opening bags. They're selling that for pennies on the pound to an aggregator, uh, collector, sorter, grader, exporter. And most of that is exported where it's hand sorted into the different categories that you see on the right. Um, the reuse fraction, industrial rag fraction, the shoddy slash stuffing fraction, and there's always gonna be a little bit residual that's waste. Um, and those are mainly uh, destined for um, international markets. Okay, we can go on to the next slide. At the same time, we've got a ton of brands, more than the ones that are listed here, these are just examples, a ton of brands across the packaging sector, the, the beverage sector, the textile sector, both apparel and home textiles um, that are making more and more ambitious commitments to incorporate recycled content into the development of their products. And this is showing specifically commitments to RPET um, or recycled PET. And right now, the majority of recycled PET that's on the market is coming from our used beverage uh, plastic bottles. But there's not enough supply of those bottles in the US to meet this growing demand. We'd have to collect over 80% of all the, the plastic bottles in the US just to meet these near-term goals um, for, for these uh, brands that are being shown. And don't forget that 
the current recycling rate for bottles is 29% and recycling is 30 years old. And so to reach that 80% threshold is a real challenge. So what are, what are we doing about it? We're thinking about what are some new sources of um, PET that we can unlock. And one of the really attractive sources of that PET is the polyester in textiles. Okay, you can go on to the next slide. There are, when you're thinking about how we're gonna get textiles back into our circular supply chain, there are sort of these six components of the recovery value chain that you have to look at and make sure you have um, you know, strategies in place for. The first thing is collection. You're not gonna be able to um, supply those RPET commitments or, or circulate textiles back into manufacturing unless you can collect the textile waste that's being generated. So you need widespread convenient collection systems. Something that's as convenient as throwing something away if you really wanna increase uh, and reach those high participation rates. Then you need some kind of facility that sorts and processes that material for all the different end markets that are out there, whether that's reuse, um, downcycling, uh, fiber to fiber recycling, and so on and so forth. Then number three, you need those really strong, robust end markets to, to you know, absorb the material that's coming out of those textile marks. Um, you also need to engage your, um, you know, your generators, whether that's the community, whether that's residents, you need to make sure that people are educated about um, the existence of systems and why the systems exist and how to use the systems. Supportive policy, um, number five, that, that is always something that's very helpful. And I see that as a huge um, supportive driver, especially in the United States in order to reach the economic um, efficiencies to developing systems to collect and sort textiles. And then finally, strategic partnerships. It's gonna take all of us working together across the supply chain and across the value chain to um, you know, move the system together, to finance the system and to test the system. Go to the next slide. Um, so that brings us to the concept of a textile MRF. One of the biggest missing pieces that I see in the system right now is the lack of a place that collected textiles can go. And if you're thinking about your normal, regular curbside recyclables, um, those are collected curbside and they are tipped at a material recovery facility or a MRF. And that's where you have all different kinds of hand sorting and, and machine sorting and technologies and equipment and conveyors that are sorting these products to all the different end markets where they're gonna be used um, and hopefully turned into new products. <clears throat> we need that same system for textiles. Textiles are very unique. They're harder to sort than your regular traditional recyclables. There are a lot of um, variables when it comes to textiles, but the overarching concept behind textile MRF is that it's a place where any kind of used textiles can go. Post-consumer, uh, post-industrial, pre-consumer, like uh, dead stock and damaged goods, um, commercial textiles, contract textiles, uh, uh, upholstery textiles. It can all go there. It would go through a system of hand and manual sorting first, so you can categorize all the materials by quality um, and all the different grades of reuse that there are. Then anything that's non-reusable would be um, shuttled along the conveyors to an automated fiber sorting um, equipment, and that uses um, you know, opticals to identify fiber type. And then you can create bales of uh, high content polyester, high content cotton, uh, you know, 60-40 poly cotton blends that can then go off to their very specific textile, textile recycling facilities. Um, and then eventually as our technology advances and we have more of that uh, digital identifiers embedded in our garments themselves, we can do some brand sorts and send materials back to brands that want their own materials back, whether that be for repair or resale. Okay, next slide. 
one of the things that you'll see, um, I have one more slide after this, and one of the things that you'll see on that slide is some recommendations. And one of the recommendations I really want to spend a, a minute talking about is conducting fiber-based waste characterization studies on textiles in the waste stream. This is really important because without knowing how much high quality con uh, cotton is there, how much high content polyester is accessible for the fiber to fiber recyclers, the fiber to fiber recyclers are not gonna be able to make the business case to scale their own facilities. And right now this, these data don't exist. People know on a high level how much polyester there is that is consumed every year, but people have no idea um, how much is 100% or 80% or accessible to the thresholds and the, the mixes that the fiber to fiber recyclers need. And labels are very inaccurate. Um, so we can't rely on labels to tell us that. And, um, and yeah, and so I guess that's the point on this slide. There are other things also that are important, like, um, you know, is it single material? Is it multi-material? Are there layers of different kinds of materials? Because that all impacts the sorting and the recyclability as well. Okay, and you can go on to the last, the last slide. So there, here are the recommendations of things that you can do today in order to start prepping this, this scene for um, a circular economy in the future. The first one is doing a market analysis, maybe just looking at the state of Georgia, you know, trying to understand where is the textile generation happening? What kind of textile waste is it? What's the composition of the textile waste, both from you know, a, 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 um, a product type, garment type, and a fiber type? And then also understanding who's handling textiles right now throughout the state. What's the flow of textiles? And that will at least get us to a common understanding and sort of a, a baseline from which to start building the rest of the system. Like I said, the second one is that fiber composition research, and that lets us build the business case for recycling. The third one is supportive policy. It's really hard to make the case for a highly manual sorting process in the United States based on um, the bottom line alone. It, it's an expensive proposition uh, to, to rely on manual sorting um, in the US. But with um, Supportive policy and in, in, in supportive policy can take many different forms. It can take you know the form of EPR or tax incentives or you know recycled content minimum recycled content mandates. There are a lot of ways to develop supportive policy for a circular textiles economy, but that will set the scene and level the playing field for uh, the different players. It could unlock a lot of investment both in the R and D, in the infrastructure, and in the operations, um, and in that sort of supply demand relationship. Educating the public, it's still a struggle. That's why we're only diverting 15% of our waste stream, right, our textile waste stream right now. People just don't know what to do with their materials. They don't know they're supposed to be diverting it. They don't know how much value is in that, is in the materials they're throwing away. And then the public-private partnerships. In order to galvanize action, we really have to be working together. You know, we, we have to be creating um, agreements and um, sort of, you know, working together to make sure that um, the risk is distributed across a number of different parts of the, ch of the chain. And I will leave it there. Marissa, thank you so much. Uh, we have Marissa's contact information up on the screen and also the website for RRS. If you're interested in downloading that white paper that is available um, right there, you just have to give us a little bit of contact information and that PDF uh, is then easily downloaded. Next up, I would like to introduce Alicia Ritchie. Alicia is the Donations and Business Development Manager for America's Thrift Stores. She has more than 10 years of experience in international business development, as well as international, national, and state political fundraising. Alicia, great to have you here today. We're ready for you to go. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for that presentation that we just heard. That was fantastic. I think I took away a few golden nuggets there. So um, one of the things that I wanna tell you quickly about the difference in America's thrift store and savers and goodwill that we just learned a little bit about is the fact that the majority of the goods that is donated to America's thrift 
is actually used inside of our stores. And we do process on site. And we do in Birmingham, Alabama, have somewhat that would be considered in structure and in analysis, a MRF. And so it's very exciting to see, you know, a call to action and to know that our company is moving in a very a strategic fashion that would be comparable to, to future endeavors that are going to be um, impactful in the environmental analysis and strategic steps forward. So to go into um, my presentation, you know, in 2019, the majority of America's thrift stores donation team collected 50 million pounds of donated goods. And by that, we diverted directly 25 million pounds from points that would have gone into landfills. That's a huge number. So 25 million pounds from Waste Stream that raised $3 million for our collective charity partners. It increased our company supply chain by 16% from over a year prior. So by that, our company decided to grow more stores. And when everyone else was shutting down locations and opportunities to divert more textiles, we began to use that supply chain to open more stores and absorb more market share. And that's one of the reasons why we um, have been able to continue to collect all throughout COVID, allowing for a greater opportunity to divert more. We, even when the international markets shut down, we were also able to continue to find additional outsources for some of the um, collected textiles that we ended up banding together um, for um, different re reuse. So you'll see that as well in the upcoming slides. So this growth allowed us again to open all of those new stores. And then we were also additionally able to show that the textile industry just from 2018 in a an market analysis was worth close to $5.2 billion across the United States and projected that by 2026, it will be worth $8.5 billion. So that's also important to understand that the call to action in financial impact is prime and ready for development across the United States, but specifically in our areas for the Southeast. So one of the, the greatest assets that has made this come together is relying on our charity partners. The other main difference for America's Thrift Store is that we uniquely partner in each state with a charity partner. Here in Georgia, it's Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, and that has allowed us to hold hands with many amazing partners moving forward. So it is doing that and addressing a few new opportunities in this industry that's allowed us to pivot and grow. Melissa, if you'll just move the, the slide. So one of the things that we've really had to tackle in this industry is to create an industry standard. And by creating an industry standard and points of collection, we have been able to make a greater impact on our collections expanding the places that we're able to um, offer the opportunity. And by in the industry standard, I do mean that um, when you say you're gonna do something, you do it and you don't you know, leave random metal kiosks um, all over a city without approval. And you don't um, you know, partner with uh, people that really didn't want your partnership. And so we have had to overcome that stigma of the random metal box and um, making sure that it is maintained for the property's integrity, but then also to honor those partners that choose to partner with us. And so we do that with accurate reporting. Believe it or not, that has been another thing that has been an industry standard that, that we have developed, but also a stigma. People have come to me over and over and said, well, your report is extremely different than the people that we have utilized for textile um, recycling in the past. And ours is very detailed because we do sort. Ours is also very um, intricate in weighing and reporting on a monthly as well as a quarterly and annual basis. So then if you'll go to the next slide for me, Melissa. 
After doing additional market research, we utilized a company, New South Research, based out of Birmingham, that allowed us to understand why do people actually want to donate? Truly defining the need to divert textiles was something that our CEO took very personally. And being able to look at what was the motivational factor for that donation has been, you know, the analysis of how we approach our future logistical analysis and improvement process in the future. So from this slide, you'll see that, you know, almost the exact same report is for what people want as either a donor or a customer. So if they're coming to our store and they want to donate, or if they're just a random donor at another point of opportunity, then it's the exact same you know, reason. The first one is because of the charity. And then with almost the exact same ratio of response, we saw it was because of convenience. Melissa, if you'll go to the next slide. So convenience was really broken down by our existing um, ATS customers and our ATS donors. And we found that by moving all of our bins to locations where it would be optimal to capitalize on convenience for the largest amount of population, that then we would be able to grow more with less. And that's impactful especially for a community that wants to reduce, you know, their carbon footprint, for a community that is trying to reduce the cost of collections, that is trying to recycle more, but by able to offer a third party customer for these recycled goods at the exact same time while sorting in our own facilities. So move to the next slide. So you can see at the, at the beginning of the 2017 initiative, we only had 253 bins. And by the end of 2020, we had 329. Now, what is relevant about this is that each bin actually only produces close to 6,000 pounds annually. And by utilizing that method of convenience and partnering strategically with amazing partners, we have been able to maximize our collections of textiles, increasing the diversion. So if you'll move to the next slide. This also was impactful because it was the ability to donate to Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. And that is really the greatest uh, difference between our organization and all of the rest is that every pound that is donated in the state of Georgia, we make a contra contribution to Children's Health Care of Atlanta annually. And um, this is the result of that. We were able to impact from 2017 to 2020 by using less for a rate of growth by doing that more strategically based upon the research that we have found. Can move to the next slide. So one of the things that I wanna close this with is that I believe that utilizing the strategic partnerships of our friends and our charity organization has led us to the greatest opportunity to maximize convenience. Maximizing convenience in multifamily gives us the ability to divert textiles at the most convenient location. And that has been the greatest partnership that I've experienced outside of the city of Atlanta and all across Metro Atlanta, and that's with Portland. So I'm proud to um, be able to, to hand over those questions over to Jana. And um, the opportunity with Portland has been able to divert quite a few tons and she'll be able to speak to that directly. But if in the event you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Thanks, Alicia. Appreciate the presentation. And everybody, you can see Alicia's contact information right there on the screen. Right now, I'd like to introduce Jana. Uh, Jana Alfiero oversees the waste management services for Cortland. She uses her extensive background in waste management to improve service, reduce costs, and enhance the resident experience. She also spearheads initiatives that not only divert waste from landfills, but also give back to local communities in which Cortland owns and operates. Jana is going to share some information about a multifamily textile collection program. So Jana, it's all yours. 
Awesome. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. I am going to push forward. Um, and basically what brought this on was when COVID happened, we were heavily impacted in the multifamily industry, as you can imagine, with more residents staying home. So I had to really move forward with the way that we do trash, recycling everything, because I started seeing that our compactor areas and disposal areas were now starting to look like uh, landfills because people were cleaning out things and just starting to get things um, at the dumpster area. So um, thankfully I was introduced to the GRC by Alicia and have met some amazing partners. And we, started, Alicia and I got together back in April, May of last year and decided that we were going to figure out how we could really help our residents out and do some different things on our communities. So I'm gonna, um, Melissa, if you'll go forward, I don't, yep, I'm just gonna keep on going. So that was part of Alicia. So I don't want to steal Alicia's thunder. So sorry about that. They are merged in there. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Keep on going. Okay. So we'll start off with Cortland, which I guess I should have started with that. We are a multifamily investment management firm. Um, we're one of the largest that own and manage in the U.S. We have 185 apartment communities across the United States with over 65,000 apartment homes. Um, just in Atlanta, Metro Atlanta alone, we have 30 apartment communities um, with over 12,000 units. So we are growing and uh, I'm really excited to partner with so many of you guys on the GRC in so many different levels, whether it's textiles, um, cardboard, furniture, you name it. I have every aspect of waste uh, with, with what I've just given to you on this slide. Um, so what we've been able to do, uh, Melissa, if you'll go to the next, is pretty excited. So in eight months in two communities, we, will ab we were able to divert 21 tons, basically, 42,500 pounds. What we did is we strategically placed these boxes by all of our compactor and recycling areas and our residents absolutely loved it. It was very, at first I was really worried about curb appeal um, just because we are high end. We pride ourselves on uh, cleanliness and the way that our appearances with our brand and our residents have fallen in love with it because they don't have to leave their apartment community to give back. Um, so that is just a pilot I did on two on 10 communities. Um, to give you an idea of what's happening next, uh, just in the, in the last week, so go ahead, uh, Melissa. We, uh, last week, I've already started placement and by the end of this week, um, Alicia's team um, I know has five boxes going out on Friday, um, but for the remainder of this year, we have 25 additional communities that will receive boxes in Atlanta. And our goal is to, to, divert, to divert 150,000 pounds in Atlanta. And I know I can do it. If I was able to do just what I did, showed you in a matter of six, seven months with nine, 10 communities, um, I'm really excited to see what we can do with 25. Nationwide, I am looking with, um, I'm working with a partner now currently, and we're looking to roll this out. Um, hopefully by the end of second quarter, and my goal is to divert um, 500,000 um, pounds. So it's, it's very challenging, as most of you know on this call, and in the multi-family spectrum to recycle, uh, because it's constant resident education to do the right thing. Um, so I'm happy that the textile diversion has been a way that I'm able to start at least diverting and recycling and headed in a positive direction. Um, and that is all I have. I am definitely not an expert in, in textile. I'm going to give it over to Lisa because I'm so excited to hear what she has to say. 
um, and learn more about her. But next is my contact info, Melissa. If anybody wants to reach out to me, um, I'm sorry, um, it was on the left side. We'll have it on the slide later on, but I wanna give it over to Lisa because I'm really excited to hear what she has to say. So thank you. Thanks, Jana. But before we go to Lisa, I, I, I do want to say we, we will make sure that the contact information is included. I, you know, we must have missed that slide somewhere, but sometimes those things do happen. Um, but thank you, Jana. Very exciting information and, uh, and your pilot, very successful. Uh, so great to see that progress happening. Our, our speaker is Lisa. Lisa Wise is the Executive Director of Initiative for Affordable Housing a nonprofit organization that provides housing and support services for homeless and low-income families. During her 28 years in this role, Lisa has overseen the development of initiatives, uh, homeless service program to serve up to 35 families per year. This includes the acquisition of three multifamily housing properties and construction of one property, providing 355 units of affordable housing to Atlanta area families. In addition, Lisa was key in developing the Reloom Employment and Job Training Program that we're going to hear about today. So, Lisa, can you uh, join us and give us some more information about Reloom, a really unique program? Thank you so much. Thank you to Gloria for including Reloom in this um, um, important discussion about excess textiles, which I can um, attest to there are a lot of. Um, and I'm happy to see on the participant list many of Reloom's friends, Dina, Keeler, Shelby, my cousin, Michelle Wiseman, and Emma and Kanika, and lots of folks who have been supporting Reloom for many years. And I appreciate the opportunity to tell you about um, our role, our very small role, but one solution to the uh, we think of Reloom as a people, purpose, planet discussion. The people are our homeless and low-income families that come through our homeless services program um, or come to us as tenants. So um, Jana, I'm excited to hear about um, apartment management recycling. And I can't wait to have an off, uh, off webinar discussion with you because we would like to start that here at our four complexes. Um, so um, Reloom is, is a program under our nonprofit. It was started a little over 10 years ago as a solution to a problem that we had internally, which was the recession coming and not having and worrying about the homeless clients that we currently had and those tenants in our affordable housing complexes not having employment or losing their employment. And so we address that issue by looking at uh, starting a on-the-job training program, for a lack of a, a, a better way to describe it. Um, so in because we all can't be um, in person today, I just put together a short video to uh, give you a, a visual of what our site looks like, and then I'll come back at the end and talk about it some more. Welcome to Reloom. We know we can't be in person together today, but I wanted to give you an idea when you come for a tour in the near future after COVID, you can see what Reloom looks like and be excited to come here because we would be very excited to have you come. Reloom is a textile heaven. We are the lucky beneficiary of lots of beautiful donated fabric and textiles that we cut up and upcycle into all kinds of product. Reloom is a low barrier employment location for homeless and low income individuals that we employ full time with benefits so that they can get back on their feet again and um, become uh, more productive members of our society to take care of their children and move on. We are here with our manager, Tammy Carden, who's going to show us how to cut some of the fabric. And as she's cutting and I'm describing, we'll talk a little bit about the fabric that comes to us. Tammy's got a pair of pants from one of our corporate partners, UPS. They have a buyback arrangement with us where they give us product 
of the old uniforms that are being um, changed into new uniforms. So we cut off all of the brand for any corporate partners. And uh, Tammy has a leg of a pant that she's going to cut in a certain way that will make it easier for the weavers to weave with. So we uh, fold the fabric. Usually uh, volunteers do all of this prep work for us because it is labor intensive. But during COVID, we, um, we are ending up doing a lot of the prep work ourselves. When we get fabric, um, just uh, fabric left over from sewers or um, quilters, it's easier to cut. But when you get a piece of clothing that can't be used for a variety of reasons, we take it all apart, cut off all of the collars and the buttons. So here we have what we refer to as a hula, which is the fabric cut up because we're gonna turn it into the longest piece of fabric that we can. And it will end up being cut at every other piece. And then eventually it will be one long uh, ball of fabric that we end up, the weavers give to the weavers as they prepare their product. So this is uh, one an, op an opportunity for volunteers. If you, uh, your company is interested in volunteering as soon as COVID is over, we would love to have you come here and help us prepare the fabric. And it will end up in this long ball that as you, as we go through the Reloom worksite, you will be able to see all of the different things that we can upcycle into beautiful product. And we take all kinds of fabric. Um, it needs to be clean, even if it's got stains or uh, cuts in it, but we do um, ask that our donors bring things to us that are clean. Um, we have a building here in the uh, northeast side of DeKalb County and, and right at the edge of Scottsdale and Clarkston. So we are easily accessible and we have been in operation for 10 years. And coming down through the break room area, we're a small site, but we make the most of our space. For those of you who know how to weave, you know that there's the warp thread, the stabilizing thread, which um, is rug strength that we buy from a mill in Auburn, Alabama. And then the weft fabric for us is the donated recycled clothing that um, we cut up, our volunteers cut up, and we make beautiful things out of. So here is the prep area so that when the weavers want to plan their project, they can come here and take whatever it is they want um, color-wise and fabric-wise to make their product. As we come down into the studio section, you can see that we have a room full of amazing looms that have been donated to us through um, very generous volunteers through the years. Reloom does all its own prep work. We do all of our own quality assurance, sewing, preparation of the looms. We've taught folks how to put the looms together and how to wind the warp so that everything is ready when they sit down to weave. We are trying to be the most efficient so each loom will have 60 yards of thread on it at one time. The UPS Brown Fabric, one of our uh, many corporate clients like Delta and Emory, the Atlanta Track Club, we've used all of their fabric to make things. But the, the uh, brown fabric that came from UPS, Miriam is weaving with, let's get a, a view from here. It's usually pretty noisy in here, so we're trying to keep the noise down from where she's weaving. So the fabric that she's weaving is a half inch yeah. wide, half inch. And she's making a, uh, either a dog leash or a key chain. And you can make something as wide as big as you want, depending on the width of it. So what she's working on now is just something that's not very wide. And it will end up, it will end up either being a keychain like this or a dog leash. Thanks, Tammy. It will end up being a dog leash, a 60-inch dog leash. As we go through, thanks, Mary. As we go through the reloom site, you can see we have big looms and we have smaller looms. The looms all have the names of the donors on them because looms have um, quite the history in our society and we want to honor the donor who has given them to us. Um, we have our own store here 
the Reloom worksite. We hope you will be able to visit and think of um, our product as you think of ideas for gifts that you might like to give to someone. Um, we have two lines of product, home decor, which would be the rugs, placemats, table runners, uh, pillows, um, any item that you would use in your home. Um, and then we have uh, accessories, which would be bags of all kinds, the smaller items like the mug rugs and the keychains, by cuffs made from Delta Airlines safety vest, um, any dog leashes, any kind of dog product, um, really anything anything that can be um, handmade we're trying to make it everything is machine washable because it is all out of recycled fabric but it has taken on a new and more beautiful life by being upcycled as well as providing uh, long-term employment or short-term depending on what our employees want to do as they uh, prepare to move forward so we're excited about this opportunity and look forward to telling you a little bit more about what we're doing um, on the Zoom camera. But I hope you'll be able to visit Relu real soon. Thank you. Thanks. I hope that that was a, a Relu. I hope that was a visual so that you could kind of see what a small site we have. We are one solution, um, really, but we're driven by addressing some of the equity and um, problems of employment or lack of job skills, um, really looking at some equity issues in our community, helping folks um, address some of those employment and education problems, especially around the affordable housing and having a sustainable income. Um, our way uh, of thinking about that is really to provide them with not just the hard skill, of the weaving, which is a very linear process and complicated, but also the soft skills that will help our employees move on to the next job in the community, regardless of what jobs they had before or lack of jobs that they had before. This is a way to practice in a, uh, a secure environment, although there are plenty of um, job employment issues that they're gonna to have to address with the manager. But this is just an opportunity for us to give them um, secure income and health benefits for many of our employees. They never did have um, health insurance before. And so there's a learning curve on how to help our folks move to the next level. We really do think of it as hard skills and soft skills and address those on a daily basis. Since we started over 10 years ago, we've had 40 something, 42, 43 folks come through our program. At one time we had 10 weavers, but honestly we're driven by how much product we sell. We, we still rely on philanthropy to help us meet our uh, salary issues because we're just not able to sell enough product to support ourselves yet. That, um, so it's an unusual business model. Um, but um, because we are a charity, we are committed to supporting our employees um, as they go through our program. I think that's probably uh, a good start. And so I'm eager to hear whatever questions folks might have. And thank you again to GRC for including us. Wonderful, thank you, Lisa. Uh, great video, must, uh, must say, great job on that one. Um, and I believe I saw a few things that I may have to go online to the shop for. Um, so uh, I would like to invite all our panelists um, uh, to a question and answer session at this point. And for the audience, if you have not submitted a question yet, now is the time, please uh, hit the Q&A button at the bottom of your uh, screen and type in your question. It'll pop up on my screen and I'll be able to um, convey those questions to the panelists. And uh, right now, uh, Lisa, since we just were talking to you, uh, there was a question about what collection organizations in Georgia currently are working with Reloom? How are you gathering all of this? Or is it more of the corporate buyback situation that you talked about with UPS? Well, uh, great question. We have plenty of fabric as, as uh, Marissa's uh, discussion started with. There's just a never ending glut of excess textiles. So we're, we're not really collecting on a larger scale unless it's a corporate client who has a buyback arrangement with us. 
we have plenty, as you can see in the video, plenty of um, textiles that come to us kind of organically from individuals who give us fabric, uh, the sewers and the quilters, clothes that come to us, we're going to source out to our homeless or uh, multifamily clients first before we um, send them out to sister agencies who may need them for their clients. If they can't be used, then we are going to use them inside the Relume site. But we are not really at this point, um, we don't have the capacity to take collections um, like from another, uh, another partner because uh, we, we don't have the capacity, whatever we make, we have to sell. And so we don't really have the larger capacity we do think we have a replicable model. So um, hopefully as the textile um, environment uh, it progresses along, thanks to Marissa and her group in GRC, that we will be able to use our little piece of it to help other communities look at textile recycling and provide jobs and job training to those who need it. Wonderful. Hope that's helpful. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I'm going to open this up to uh, Alicia. Um, how how can someone start a clothing collection in their community? Where, where do they send their textiles after collecting it? I think it's more, how does that process work? Can you remind me? So do I understand your question correctly? How would they start their own? Or how would they start working in existing models like ours? Um, I think there is a clothing collection within their community. So maybe how does the model work with your organization? Okay. So in many instances in many communities across the Southeast, but specific to Georgia, um, what we do is we partner with organizations like, you know, Keep America Beautiful or Keep Gwinnett Beautiful or um, municipal, you know, uh, contracts at landfill sites or at convenient recycling centers. And so that is typically the first place that we would initiate uh, a point of convenience. And then, you know, the second is utilizing things um, in a way that creates repeatability. So we all know the specific places that we go to typically each week in a, a non-COVID environment and um, optimizing those to be textile donation recipient locations. So, you know, that's really the, um, the key there. To find out how to, um, you know, partner with us, feel free to just send me a text. Um, I am pretty broad at partnering with whether it's a, you know, individual business, a property owner, a mission thrift, you know, like Lisa's, um, we find ways to make the opportunity um, advantageous for all the hands coming together. Wonderful. Um, Lisa, I'm going to uh, throw this one your way. There's a technology question um, regarding dissolving fabrics and separating components into reusable chemicals. Do you have any comment on that, where that sits, the status of that technology in textile recovery? Yeah, there, it's a, an emerging field. There are uh, several companies that have developed technologies and several other com companies that are in the process of developing technologies that can do that material to material or textile to textile recycling. And the, the processes that are used um, vary depending on the different technology provider. Um, but some of them are, um, you know, uh, enzymatic dissolution or other types of dissolution where you're dissolving the cellulosic portion. Um, and then you can um, recover uh, the cellulosic portion out of that and, and spin it back into a yarn um, or, or a fiber or a thread. There's also, um, technologies that allow you to recover polyester um, and nylon. And so, you know, they're at a stage of development right now where they have, um, you know, it, it spans a range. Some of them are um, still in development stage. Some of them have, um, you know, completed lab stage. Some of them have completed demonstration and pilot stage and, and are in the process of commercializing. Um, however, in order for them to commercialize, they need a steady supply, steady reliable supply of feedstock that meets their input specifications um, at a cost that 
um, you know, covers the operational um, part of their of their uh, business and the, and the actual processing of the material for sale to end market. So um, I think that gives a pretty good overview. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Marissa. Um, Jana, I wanted to ask you what I mean. We're all familiar with multifamily properties, right? But what made your group decide to take on textiles? What, what was there a demand from your residents? Was it something that was a corporate goal? What, what drove you guys to, to partner up with America's Thrift Stores? It was when seeing residents not being able to leave their homes and generating more trash by uh, not by people staying at home 24 seven. Um, you know, we went from people went to work and then came home, did their social things and then slept and then went to work again. Now it's people are home um, all the time. So I had to figure out our, my waste costs were going up and going up. And um, I had to figure out a way to try to drive that cost down. But also we do want to be more sustainable and do things um, that can help um, our environment and, and be more friendly um, with, with, with better solutions. So whether it's going to be textiles, whether it's going to be um, doing things with all of our appliances that come out of our units or um, construction debris, if I'm giving that back to local charities, um, it's just as a whole, Cortland wants to be able to start giving back and diverting because we do have generate so much waste, regardless of what stream it is. So we're excited. It's it's I think it's going to be really big and we're excited to see what we're going to end the year with. Wonderful. Thank you, Jana. Um, this one, I think it might be a Marissa question. Um, what are the key arguments to be made to get municipal solid waste budgets redistributed to the collection and sorting functions of a textile recycling initiative? That's a great question. Um, so I think there are, it, it's a complex issue. So one thing I'll say is that, you know, municipal solid waste budgets right now are covering the collection of textiles. It's just going to landfill and incineration with no value recovery out of it. Um, that said, we do concede that there is an added cost if you're gonna segregate the select the collection of textiles from everything else. There's a lot of um, research and logistics and, and testing and piloting that needs to happen to see what the best frequency um, of collection is and um, the quality of the material that's being collected and things like that. Um, however, it's, it's, you know, it, it's tough if we're relying on municipal budgets and taxpayers to fund this system. It has to be collaboratively funded. Um, there has to be participation from the industry in order to make it work. Um, you know, one of the things I've been talking about a little bit recently is with all the packaging EPR schemes that are that are hitting um, the policy records recently. Um, I'm wondering what kind of impact is that going to have on municipal budgets? Is it going to free up budgets to focus on other things? Um, food waste is is a, is a top priority. It's, it's a huge portion of our waste stream, um, and you know high greenhouse gas um, emissions from, from landfilling those things. So some of that freed up municipal budget might go to that, but is there a municipal budget that will be freed up that could go to um, thinking about what kind of textile solutions they could fund? Awesome, thank you. Um, Alicia, I, I wanted to give you a chance to, I know you touched on it, but I think it's a really important point, um, establishing peace of mind or ensuring that things are actually, you know, being reused or recycled. You know, once it goes into the bin, you know, we have a lot of people who are a little skeptical on what's happening. So with your program, I know you mentioned a lot about the reporting. Is that how you ensure that things are actually going where they should be going? Yeah, you know, um, thank you so much for this question. I, I'm not sure where it came from, but I, I love the opportunity to talk on this because this, you know, really does allow us to show how we are changing the industry stigma. 
And um, the reality is, is that you guys are correct. You know, people donate to these random boxes and you have no idea where it's going to go. And in this process, I'm going to walk you through it. So random Joe, you know, goes ahead and donates to one of our Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, America's Thrift Store box. And when they do that, those textiles actually become property of um, Children's Healthcare of Atlanta and we donate the uh, proceeds back to them for that donation opportunity. We collect typically at each location twice a week. And then we also record the amount of weight from that point of collection at the point of collection. And that's utilized through a different data, you know, metric. And so then we also can analyze, you know, how well we're doing on our own assessment of, you know, reducing the impact of collections that occurs on the environment, right? And so once we collect all of that up in, in a route, it goes back to one of our stores where an entire team has um, processed every single one of those bags after it's weighed again off of that truck. So we know how much it's coming from each box. And then we know again, collectively what's coming out of each route. And then we compare and contrast those numbers. Then it goes through um, a process of sorting through our entire team. Um, our COO actually came from Savers, which is another one of the largest thrift operations in the Northern hemisphere. And so it's a, it's a beautiful system. And um, we then move through whether or not how it's going to be sorted, um, you know, the type of garment that it is, and there's an entire processing model for that. Then when we find that one item may not be usable, it goes into what we will consider rags. And then rags is then bailed and recycled again. Because of COVID, we have really driven our capability to find additional opportunities here for recycling here in the United States. And I'm so proud of our team for doing that. Our sorting warehouse is a location where we actually could pilot a program that Mo Marissa has described in you know, a nutshell. And so it would be opportunistic to discuss that a little offline with you, Marissa. Thanks, Alicia. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you uh, this question and Alicia, you actually might jump in as well. But I'm gonna start with Jana. Um, when you were doing your pilot uh, with your, your 10 communities, um, what type of education or initiatives or outreach did you have to do with your residents to aware that this was available, but then get them to participate? So yeah, we have a marketing team and what our marketing team did came out with um, notifications that we sent to the residents and let them know about the box and where it was located. And then another thing we did was did community drives with America's Thrift and did some promotional things like um, tacos and margaritas at the clubhouse. So once you drop off your, your goods, uh, stop by social distance, of course, uh, we have to be very care careful with that kind of thing, but drop it by, come get your margarita, taco, um, as kind of a courtesy thank you for giving back to your local community. Um, at one drive, I think Alicia was able to do about 2,000 pounds. Um, and the, the residents absolutely loved it in that demographic. They want to have one like generally once a quarter if we can do it. But we're getting ready to push the local drives of our Atlanta communities um, for spring cleaning. So they... The residents get really engaged and get excited. I'm not gonna say that it's worked at every single community that, we tr that we've tried. Um, it takes a lot of engagement and getting your managers on board and, and getting the residents on board. But um, for the most part, and most of the Metro Atlanta areas, it's been very successful doing the drives. It's, it's been um, a fantastic opportunity to show how multifamily can make a very large impact in a very small way. And so, you know, partnering with Jana in, at Cortland, it really did showcase the, the talent that Cortland has, 
from marketing down to Jana's, you know, um, implementation of another way to recycle. And then also the fantastic managers that Cortland has. They are constantly trying to provide something new uh, for their residents. And the residents really did love it in all of the locations that, you know, we did pilot it. The turnout just was a little different based upon the frequency and uh, the marketing that rolled out. So it was fantastic for us. Right now, I, I believe me, I understand and I understand that, you know, it's not a one and done and that's okay. <laughs> You repetitively, especially uh, where there's the potential for new residents to be constantly coming in. It's the re-education that has to happen um, as you have turnover of residents. Um, Marissa, I, we have this, this very large open-ended question that I'm going to throw your way and you can take it wherever you want to take it. What will the collection and sorting supply chain, what do you think that's going to look like in the next five to ten years? Well, I think within the next five years, we're going to see a lot of progress. There are a lot of innovative um, people and companies working on this uh, area, working on the topic of how to, you know, recover textile waste and find value in it. Um, within the next five to 10 years, we should see um, at least some commercialized uh, fiber to fiber textile recycling. Um, and because of that, we'll have to develop our collection systems and, and our sorting uh, systems to feed those facilities. So I think that we're also probably going to be looking at more and more um, talk of policy. Policy is a slow, uh, you know, change maker, but um, well, it's slow to develop and implement the policy. Um, so, you know, we're U.S. is a little bit behind um, some other parts of the world, especially Europe, that has been really aggressive in, in looking at policy for textiles. Um, but I wouldn't say it's out of the realm of possibility in the next five and certainly 10 years here in the United States. Um, we also have a lot of uh, industry collaboration that's happening that um, and, and a lot of attention to the circularity part and the recovery part of the value chain within um, some of the biggest brand, uh, you know, textile and apparel brands that there are. It's a topic at every industry trade group. Um, there are working groups <laughs> actively thinking through all the different topics and all the different nuances. Um, and there are a lot of brands and companies um, that need to make good on the commitments that they've, uh, you know, put out there in front of people. So I think within the next five years, we're going to see a lot of activity on developing and thinking through and, and starting to set up the systems. And by um, the next 10 years out, I think we're going to have some functioning systems. That's great. Um, I, there's a couple of questions um, and I thought maybe you could just quickly address it. How do you choose where to put the bins? <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. I want to go back to the one that Marissa just answered. I know that there are two states specifically, uh, Massachusetts and North Carolina, that are currently trying to um, pass a no more textiles in the landfill bill. So, I mean, being abreast on top of, you know, the textile legal development is really something that could help us all here in the GRC, you know, pivot, well, this has happened in other states and this is why it's made an impact and move that forward possibly to a legislative, you know, um, opportunity here at the GRC. So um, I would love to be able to send that, you know, link here to anyone that would like it later after we answer the, the next question. Um, how do we place the bins? So beautiful question. Thank you for asking. Um, we first um, utilize you know, our partnerships. When someone wants to you know, partner with us, then we place a bin based upon you know, where they feel like it's gonna be best. The second, we you know, analyze the property and try to figure out where the point of convenience is going to be to enter in and to maintain the integrity of the property. Because sometimes you know, if you put one in a back hidden alley with no light, it's gonna get, you know, unsightly donations. And if you put it underneath the light at the front of the property that showcases that, you know, this is 
a great opportunity for recycling, then you know it's easily maintained. So the second point is you know making sure that we um, do offer offer the opportunity for you know the hands and feet that are doing amazing work inside of our own communities and that's partnering with you know municipalities that's partnering with mission thrifts that's also partnering with strategic um, businesses like Plato's Closet, Once Upon a Child. Um, all of those opportunities are ways to serve as an out market to help them continue to recycle those goods and not just go to a landfill because they can't sell them. So it's a wonderful um, strategic approach that really is developed on convenience and maximizing the opportunity to continue the, the marketplace. I keep hearing partnership and collaboration and, and everything going through all the threads that the four of you have spoken about. Um, Lisa, we've had a question is, how can, how can the GRC community help with Reloom, help with the charity that you're 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 doing wonderful work with. What are there certain goals that you have set? Are there certain activities uh, people can become a part of? W what can the community do to support? Thanks for asking that question. Well, we would love to have more folks know about us because it brings volunteers, it brings financial donations, it brings potential corporate partners. It brings education. It, it brings the opportunity for other communities to look at a program like ours, where you combine the textile recycling with the helping uh, folks with employment. So um, the more folks know about us, the more we can uh, tell our story and inspire other folks to um, hopefully continue, as everybody is saying, to collect their textiles and keep them from the landfill. Um, of course, um, any corporate partners who are interested in learning about us and doing some buyback with either their old uniforms or t-shirts or any kind of uh, purchase, we're ex extremely interested in having folks know about who we are and what we do. So thanks to the GRC for including us today. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Alicia, I'm going to give you a, a minute or so and it's your final thoughts or last uh, impactful, inspiring words you want to give our audience. You know, uh, first of all, thank you to um, you, Melissa, for helping to host this and to um, Gloria and to Karen uh, at the GRC. This has just been such a wonderful um, group to be a part of. Um, when it comes to the collection and the method that we use over at America's Thrift, we're always, um, you know, open doors to walk anyone around to see our process and we would love to invite you um, to do that. Uh, the next opportunity for, you know, diverting textiles, I really feel is for all of us to continue to do what it is that we do and, you know, reuse and rewear. And if we're done doing that, then, you know, move it to a, a point in which it can become a double blessing. And that's something that we focus on a lot at America's Thrift. And that's when you donate to us, you're actually donating to Children's Healthcare of Atlanta or Make-A-Wish of Middle Tennessee or Make-A-Wish of Alabama or, you know, Teen Challenge of the Mid-South. And so it's in that opportunity that we can serve the environment and that we can also serve others that um, are in our community. And so Lisa, I just, my, my hat's off to you for continuing to do what you do. Marissa, thank you so much for the education you provided today. Jana, it's always a pleasure to work alongside you. Thank you for the opportunity with Portland. And um, that's where we're at. Awesome, thank you, Alicia. Jana, any final thoughts? Thank you guys, by uh, echoing what Alicia said. Uh, if you guys have questions or want to partner with anything or um, just call me, reach out to me. I'm always excited to meet new people and and learn and I'm, I'm a guinea pig. So uh, let me be your guinea pig if you have something new and exciting. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Jana. Marissa, final thoughts? Um, together, I think we can do this. Let's, let's move beyond the 15% diversion rate and let's try to get as high up there as we can. There's a lot of clothing out there. Um, there are, you know, there are things we can do on the 
waste prevention and reuse side, um, waste minimization side, but then there is also a lot we can do with the waste that we can generate. Thank you again to our four panelists. You guys are awesome. Um, each of you is contributing in unique ways, yet they're all interconnected. So it's fabulous to see great work being done on such a, a, you know, a, a difficult um, material to tackle. Ah, material, <laughs> I made a joke there. Um, closing remarks. I'm gonna hand this off to Gloria Hardegree. She is the executive director of the Georgia Recycling Coalition. Uh, Gloria, you want to go ahead and say a few last words? Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I don't know about you, but this made me want to clean out my closet this weekend. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to that as a, a little project uh, to contribute to the cause. But I, we hope at least that this has opened up your thought process into looking into how you might um, look into textile recycling, textile reuse as an opportunity to improve your programs. Um, I want to first and foremost thank RRS, uh, Marissa and Melissa for their participation and for hosting us today and for the knowledge they have brought through their white paper. Uh, obviously our speakers, please reach out to them. This is an awesome, awesome panel of women. And I know that they're out there and ready to um, talk to you some more about what they're doing. Uh, I want to thank our program committee and our board of directors, Abby Patterson, Bianca Workentine are our co-chairs of our program committee, thank you for your input. And obviously we wanna always acknowledge our sponsors. Um, these are our partner level sponsors who support all of our programs and projects during the years. And on the next slide, um, Melissa, we have also thanking our sustainer and patron level partners. We've been so happy um, even during these difficult times to grow our patron level sponsor um, by four, and in fact, in this year, we're very excited to see that grow. And then the next slide, we hope you'll stay tuned for more programming. We made a decision back in the fall to do a webinar series that was not just about traditional materials. So our fall winter webinar series started with organics in December. We did this textile one and we look forward to March talking about e-scrap and addressing obviously that problematic lithium ion battery scenario that we're, we've all heard about and some of us are dealing with negative impacts from that. Uh, our, next our next major training session will be our semi-annual training meeting in April. Stay tuned for details about that. And it's not on the slide, but we'll, I will mention that we are looking at, fingers crossed, a potential late October, perhaps, maybe, kind of, sort of, hopefully, live conference. We'll see how that all pans out. Uh, the board and the program committee will be working on that in the next few months to see how we can pull that off. Um, if that doesn't happen, for whatever reason, we'll get back to you with, with, with plan B, but we hope that will be the outcome. Um, so with that said, make sure to check our website and obviously please check out our Recycle Right Georgia campaign. Uh, we started, we launched this in November. Um, it's gotten very good um, traction and we still have a long ways to go with all types of content for this year. We will be um, rolling out the video for, well, we rolled out the glass video last week. We'll be rolling out the video for uh, aluminum cans, hopefully this week or next week, and then the paper one the following week. So still a lot of content to come that's new. Uh, and engaging for you and your communities. And if you're a city or county or a um, municipality, we hope that you will also participate in the municipal measurement program, the MMP, uh, because we need data in order for us to go back to potential grantors, um, to put together more campaigns like the Recycle Right Georgia campaign, we have to have metrics. So we hope that you will participate in that and let us know as members, what we can do to assist you in your programs. Thanks for joining us today.